Zoom Zoom, you know, is Mazda. Let's go places. That's Toyota. The ultimate driving machine can only be BMW. How do we know this? Because thanks to advertising, it's been planted in our brains. No doubt, car ads are everywhere, pervasive and persuasive. So how did we get from modest newspaper ads run off a printing press to all the press you could want on your favorite car at the tap of an app? And why is Matthew McConaughey talking to himself in a Lincoln Navigator? Where is this headed? And where has it been? Today, we're exploring the history of car ads. Since the first automobile rolled off the assembly line, there have been advertisements to sell them. In the early days of selling cars, convincing people to get behind the wheel of this newfangled, horseless contraption without fear of premature death was the main goal. The ads were basic black and white prints that emphasized the automobile as the ultimate in luxury and convenience. The very first car advertisement was done by the Winston Motor Company in 1898 with a headline that simply stated, dispense with a horse. As the popularity of cars increased, ads turned to extravagant illustrations and bold slogans to compete for drivers' attention. The message shifted from safety to emphasizing easy mobility and where the car could take you, into the secluded woods, to a neighborhood bar to meet someone special, or the opportunity to make a dramatic exit if the need be. You know when we wrote that, it sounded fine, but when I say it out loud, it just sounds like we're selling the car to a serial killer. Henry Ford capitalized on this concept of go anywhere and do anything when he introduced the Model T in 1908. The first ad appeared in Life magazine, and while there were other better known competitors like Oldsmobile, Cadillac, and Packard, their ads pitched expensive brands that spoke to wealthy Americans. You know, the great Gatsby types. But Ford believed that not just the rich, but all Americans wanted their own automobile. His Model T ads said things like, a car for the multitudes and high price quality in a low price car. Because the Ford Motor Company mastered mass production to a T. <laughs> to a T, are you kidding me? Oh jeez. The car, it's called that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I do not know what that the, shit. What's going on? Because the Ford Motor Company mastered mass production to a T, Ford was able to keep the price down at just $850, about $20,000 today. And that was the biggest selling point, the price. His strategy of targeting the common man paid off, and within the first year, Ford sold 10,000 Model Ts. Ford's pitch to the average person revolutionized the nature of American society. Middle-income families gained a new mobility, and life was no longer centered around your home and neighborhood. People could escape their small town and see the rest of the country. A newfound freedom was born with Ford's simple appeal to the masses. By the 1920s, car ads reflected the optimism and freewheeling sign of the times. As a result of this carefree decade, consumers hungered for more than just a sturdy and affordable car. They wanted style, speed, and luxury to boot. With the passing of the 19th Amendment, women finally got the right to vote. As a result, the 1920s and 30s saw advertisers specifically targeting women in their ads. The concept of being in control of your own destiny was a prevalent theme. This continued throughout World War II, when men were fighting on the battlefield and women filled the labor force. The ad guys were fully on board with selling to the ladies, but sometimes a heavy dose of chauvinism was thrown in with a pitch. A 1940 Buick advertisement proclaimed, Weep no more, ladies. Now there's a big car even you can drive. The ad went on to state that the Buick's interior was roomy enough to hold a tea party. Nothing wrong with that. That's not weird at all. During the post-war years, tons of suburbs popped up in America, creating a driving force behind a major car boom. People commuting back and forth from work in the cities needed a car, and it was nirvana for advertisers. 1950s car advertising was all about showing off a car's feature and its great designs. By this time, American car brands had hit their stride and consumers were familiar with the model, so advertisers relied on that familiarity to cut to the chase. Pages and magazines were stuffed with polished images, like add to the mix a little invention called television, and car advertisers had another method to reach consumers in a big way. Traditional media like radio, magazines, and newspapers were still important in the early part of the 50s, but television was quickly becoming the cornerstone of many advertisers' national media plans. The advertiser's goal in the 1950s was to link car ownership with the idea of comfortable suburban living. Some 50s TV commercials offered cute, rhyming jingles like 
see the USA in your Chevrolet, but others went right for the jugular to get your attention. In car crazed Southern California, automobile pitchmen were nutty and berserk figures on TV screens. One guy named Cal Worthington stood taller and lasted longer than any of these other deranged dudes. Sporting a Stetson hat and speaking with a twangy Oklahoma drawl, he broke the mold when it came to outlandish car salesmen willing to do anything to get you in the showroom. While some guys posed with cute puppies to get customers on the lot, Cal upped the ante and had a menagerie of furry, exotic sidekicks. Actually, they were zoo animals, and he always announced them as his fictitious dog, Spot. By the mid-1950s, cars beat packaged goods and cigarettes as the most heavily advertised products. Everything was going great for American automakers and the ad men hired to sell their latest models. Then, in 1960, it all changed when one ad hit like a bolt of lightning. Overnight, Volkswagen's Think Small campaign had the American public talking about the tiny German-made Beetle. This campaign catapulted Volkswagen into the stratosphere of car advertising. Teenagers ripped it out of magazines and pinned it on their walls, and the ad guys on Madison Avenue viewed it with suspicion and jealousy. It was a game changer for an ad industry that had, until that time, hammered customers with over-the-top, extravagant claims of how their product changed your life. Volkswagen's approach was creative, subtle, and self-deprecating. Think Small and Lemon campaigns and others that followed didn't talk down to consumers and appealed to their intelligence. Volkswagen's honest and simple campaign fit right in with the changing times of the 60s, where youth culture was becoming a force and a rebellion against mass consumerism was taking shape. Advertisers were soon following Volkswagen's lead, trashing overhyped sales pitches for more playful campaigns that stressed individuality rather than conformity. Marketing and advertising pros consider the Think Small campaign the gold standard of advertising. Volkswagen Beetle sales grew into the hundreds of thousands throughout the 1960s, and by 1970s, sales had topped out at over 570,000 in the US. In the 1980s, with the stock market riding high and the rise of yuppies and Gordon Gecko type corporate raiders now part of the culture, what you drove was seen as a status symbol. If you were driving a Lamborghini or a Porsche, then you had made it. As a result of this climate, consumers were seeing more higher class and foreign car ads. The downside was that car ads in the 80s had become pretty cookie cutter in their presentation. A cabin so quiet you can hear a pin drop and a relaxed, practically comatose driver at ease behind the wheel was par for the course in a car commercial. Breaking from the monotony was one campaign that showed a little fish in a big pond can compete with the sharks, my favorite animal. With the goal of boosting sales in the US, in 1986, the Japanese car manufacturer Isuzu launched their Joe Isuzu commercials. Armed with only a limited budget, the campaign surprised everyone with its unique approach and became a wild success. A fictional car salesman who oozed a smarmy demeanor and lied through his fake smile face made outlandish claims about the abilities of the Isuzu. Isuzu really leaned into the fact that car ads often exaggerated the product, and people were refreshed by the honesty. This comic take on the shady salesman cliche was a hit with consumers, but there was one little problem. He was more popular than the car. Except for an immediate 18% spike in sales, Isuzu's success was short-lived. Ads that followed attempted to highlight more features of the car and put it back in the spotlight. But for audiences, the true star was always Joe Isuzu. The campaign was retired in 1990 with a tough lesson learned. Don't let the messenger outshine the message. What advertisers had discovered is that celebrity endorsements, particularly car endorsements, can be a major crapshoot. Choose the right star and it can create a buzz, boost sales and even bolster the brand. Pick the wrong personality and an automaker might turn off customers and lose millions of dollars in the process. For example, wanting to court a younger demographic, Chrysler hired Celine Dion to the tune of $14 million as spokeswoman for their 2002 Pacifica. Cause that makes sense. Dealers only sold around 4,000 Pacificas after the ad campaign began, in stark contract to the projected 60,000 units. Yikes. One lesson the ad industry knows well is that a spot during the Super Bowl is the holy grail for advertisers. It's a cardinal rule that advertisers keep their new campaigns under wraps to avoid spoiling the big reveal. But for the 2011 Super Bowl, Volkswagen was stuck between a rock and a hard place. 
it had bought two 30 second spots for the big day, one showing off the new Jetta and the other for the new Passat. The spot called the Force for the Passat model featured a little boy dressed up as Darth Vader. However, there was also a 60 second version that the Deutsch ad team who created the spot felt was much stronger. Unfortunately, it was too long to run during the Super Bowl. So in an attempt to stand out and get as much mileage as possible, Deutsch made the bold move of posting the Force on YouTube the Wednesday before the game. By early the next morning, the spot had 1.8 million hits. It scored 17 million views before the coin toss at game time on Sunday. To date, The Force has racked up 61 million views on YouTube and is the most shared Super Bowl ad of all time. Of all the ads that run during the Super Bowl, it's the car industry that's been the single largest advertising category every year since 2010, with advertisers willing to pay a steep price for a 30 second spot. This year, it was 5.5 million dollars on average. It's obvious having your commercial play during the Super Bowl is a big deal, but here's something interesting. 2017 Super Bowl was wall to wall car commercials. This year, only seven brands ran a spot. So where'd they go? Online. Turns out the Force commercial was just a preview of things to come for advertising and the internet. Social media has exploded in recent years and being savvy about the various digital platforms is a must have skill for advertisers to have in their toolbox. Social media marketing has become the pillar of the advertising industry and the car business is the leading charger. Pretty much every brand has an online presence and it's become a huge tool for generating hype for a new car. The Dodge Demon, the 2020 Ford Bronco and the new Supra have all used teaser campaigns to get people stoked for their upcoming release. The conversation between users and car brands has gotten so fluid over social media that in 2016, one guy in Spain posted a hashtag buy a car on Twitter challenge to see if any manufacturer would sell him a vehicle over the social network. Nissan answered his challenge and gave him a tour of the new Nissan X-Trail with the Periscope app. The guy then asked his followers if he should buy it and they said yes, so he did, naturally. Wow. This guy bought a car and even picked it up at Spain headquarters without even going to the dealership. The future is so full of potential. This could totally change the way we buy cars. It's a brave new world when it comes to automotive advertising. Unlike in the past where car advertising was focused strictly on what the car can do for the consumer, today it's about what the car can do to the consumer. When Matthew McConaughey conducts an orchestra of his surroundings behind the wheel of a stationary Lincoln Navigator or stands next to a sleek Lincoln Continental in the shimmering shallow water on a glacial plain in Iceland, these images are evocative. Car advertisers are appealing to your senses. They're going for the right side of your brain. That emotional, creative chunk of gray matter, it's miles away from the paint by numbers, logical, left brain sided lump that ads of the 1950s tapped into. Things are moving at such lightning quick speeds. Who knows, five years from now, taking a virtual test drive on your iPhone might seem as old school as looking at a print ad in a newspaper. A big thank you to Honey for sponsoring this episode of Wheelhouse. Honey is a free browser extension that helps you get the best deal anytime you buy something online. I had to replace my brakes a few weeks ago and Honey helped me save a bunch of money. I'm talking cold, hard cash. All it takes is two clicks to install Honey on your browser and it's free. Honey works silently in the background while you shop, scanning and testing every coupon code on the internet. When you're on a checkout page where you can enter a promo code, Honey will automatically try all known coupon codes for that store. If Honey finds a code that works, it'll apply the one that saves you the most money to your cart. Honey does everything for you. It's that easy. If you don't have Honey installed already, you're literally passing up free money. So hit that link below and get Honey today. Remember, it's all free, takes two clicks, and saves you cash. We look at weird stuff in car culture and history every week, so make sure you hit that yellow subscribe button right around here so you never miss an episode. If you want to know more about Henry Ford, check out this episode of Wheelhouse or check out this episode of Up to Speed. Be nice. See you next time.